So welcome back to Orchid House. I'm Olivier in Fort Lauderdale and today I want to give you some general guidance as to Phalaenopsis uh, growing. So I guess everybody has this in mind when they think of Phalaenopsis. Uh, they are so popular. One of the reasons is that first of all you have all these different colors and different lips and, uh, and also they thrive in indoor growing and they are very not so finicky compared to most orchids so that's uh, one of the reasons of their success now uh, what's maybe less known is that uh, in terms of species there's like 70 or 80 species and the vast majority are small flowers so big flowers like this there's maybe i don't know seven or eight species they are in the background of, of these these hybrids but the majority of the uh, the phalaenopsis species are actually small flowers now as a general rule, uh, all the large ones will bloom in the spring and what they need is actually a drop in temperatures and a, a, ni a nice differential between daytime and nighttime uh, and also less, less light and that's, that's what's going to initiate the spiking and so they bloom in the spring. The small ones, not all of them, but the majority actually bloom in the summer and what triggers their bloom is completely different. They have long uh, days, so a lot of light exposure and a lot of heat. So it's a completely different uh, animal. Now your hybrids can bloom any time of the year, obviously, that's why they are hybrids. Uh, I think the majority, especially if they are large like one, they will tend to bloom in the spring. Uh, but again, they, they could bloom several times a year. Now, in terms of uh, light, so Phalaenopsis are low light plants. This is actually a, a, a hybrid with Gigantia in the background. It's very fragrant. And uh, so that one actually takes a little bit high of higher light. But in general, I mean, you, sh you can give them pure shade. I mean, some of the, uh, the species like Violacea, Bellina and others, they, they thrive in, in pure shade. Uh, no, no direct sunlight at all. I see these hybrids grow in the, exposed to the sun here, bright light in Florida. I don't think it's ideal, but some seem to, uh, to survive it. I would say uh, if you want to give them a lot of light, it's always best to do that starting in the winter when there's uh, shorter days, the sun is not as harsh. Uh, and uh, so they slowly get used to, uh, to a strong sun and that's the best way to do it. If you put them out there in the middle of July, uh, that's a recipe for disaster. Now, if you have mottled leaves like these, that's another sign of, of shade. I mean, these, these mottled leaves, they don't like uh, direct sunlight. So you have to be uh, mindful of that. Watering, there's a whole video that I made two or three years ago that explains how I do it. So a mounted plant like this one, for instance, needs to be watered every day and even twice a day in the summer. Uh, sometimes I feel like it might need even more water. <laughs> uh, and uh, now if they are potted the way I do it, so technically, so these are called monopodial orchids, just like the Vanda. So they grow up, they never grow sideways, although they, they can have kikis. And unlike many of the, the, uh, the orchids, they don't have a bulb that stores uh, water. There's no reserve. So technically you should water them more. But in my experience, if you grow them on the dry side, you let them dry out entirely and then you give them a real good soaking, you have the best results. So what you want, this is Mini Mark, by the way. Somebody recently asked me about Mini Mark. Uh, it's a very popular uh, little hybrid. But so you see what matters is this, inside the pot you have these fresh new roots with green tips. That's a healthy plant. The, the way to healthy blooms are healthy roots. And right now it's fairly dry, so that's the way I grow it. Another example here, uh, this is another uh, hybrid, beautiful little flowers, fragrant as well. And look at the pot, all these roots that are growing, it's a very healthy plant. Uh, I use uh, transparent plastic pots because uh, I can see through them. And so this way I can monitor the, the health of the plant and the health of the roots. I can also see how dry or not dry it is. If you use a clay pot, I mean, uh, the way to do it is, is weigh the pot and then you may have a, a feel of how dry it is or not. But I think this is much easier. 
So my recommendation, grow them on the dry side, except if they are mounted, then they really need to be uh, watered every day. Uh, temperatures, the vast majority of Phalaenopsis are warm growers, so they need at least 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 Celsius. There is a small group uh, from plants that come from China and the Himalayas and, and higher elevations. Uh, they are usually very small flowers. Uh, I don't grow them for obvious reasons, they will never uh, survive here in South Florida, but the, the, the vast majority, they are really warm growers. Again, if you grow them indoors, it's going to be perfectly fine, they are, they are perfectly suited for that purpose. Now, cutting spikes. Uh, this is an example, this actually happened by accident. So. Uh, this is a big flower, a big uh, flower like this one. I, it broke off. I mean, there was a mishap and it broke off right there. And uh, as you can tell, it started growing two new spikes now, right there. One shooting this way, the other one that way. And uh, you often hear people telling you when the spike is spent and the flowers are dead, if you cut it, uh, it's going to rebloom. So first of all, technically you should cut it, you count one, two nodes, sometimes three, and you cut somewhat above the node. And yes, I would say maybe 50% of the time they will rebloom. Personally, I'm not a huge fan because basically the presentation is going to be damaged. You see what happens when they rebloom like this, they go in all directions and you have a kind of a lopsided plant. So. I mean, it works, uh, but I, I think if, you, if you're doing a good job and your plant is healthy, just cut the spike entirely and, and you're going to have a brand new spike uh, starting from uh, the bottom. Now, this is for hybrids. Now, there's a bunch of these small species. I actually didn't take one here. Uh, the preparation was wrong. Uh, many of these small species, they have like Tetraspis, uh, Violacea and others, they have spikes that uh, stay green for years on end and they're going to continue blooming and re-blooming, they're going to continue extending. So you do not trim those off until they turn brown. So you have to do some research, that's for the small species. Uh, you have uh, Cornus cervi is another one, uh, I mean the spike can bloom for five or ten years if, if you're doing a good job and if the plant is, is healthy, so do not cut it off. Then uh, fertilizing, uh, my general approach to fertilizing, that's true for all my orchids, I just consider that icing on the cake. Uh, if you got the light wrong, uh, if you got the watering wrong, uh, you can fertilize as much as you want, you're not going to get much of a result. Uh, and I mean, you hear different uh, ideas, some people swear by that product, others by another product. So what I do, I just use four different type of fertilizer and I, since I fertilize once a week on Sunday, I'm a creature of habit and uh, that, that helps you keep a schedule, uh, I alternate them. So this way, I mean, they get, they get exposed to different uh, types of fertilizer and I'm not a scientist. I don't even know how the scientists test these fertilizer and how efficient they are, but that's basically my approach. And then I, I do some seaweed uh, kelp extract once a month, which, which is uh, generally considered uh, good for, for the, the health of the plant. So I think I've covered most of the, uh, the things that you need to know. Uh, Phalaenopsis are easy to grow, uh, they are beautiful, uh, so that's why they are so popular. And I think if you follow some of that advice, you should be doing great. Thank you so much for tuning in and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.